90,000 people, approximately. Scattered throughout the city were a number of synagogues, much like this one. The synagogue had become the center of religious worship for the Jewish people, as well as the center of their social lives, and the synagogue serves that same purpose for the Jewish people to this day. A beautiful palace had been built by a Gentile queen. Her name was Helena, and she was the queen mother of a small Mesopotamian kingdom called Ibiobane, located at what is today the northwest corner of Iraq. She and her son, the king, both converted to Judaism. They had great love for the Jewish people. And in 42 AD, when a famine hit the land, they sent grain to help feed the people. And out of gratitude, she was allowed to build this palace in the city, even though she was a Gentile. At my feet was the council house where matters of the religious law were settled. The first five books of the Old Testament, called the Pentateuch, contain what we commonly identify as the Ten Commandments. The Jewish people identified 613 commandments. Over the centuries, they developed hundreds, even thousands of traditions, many of which made their way into the law. By the days of the New Testament, that law was so complex, no one knew what it said. <laughs> the other building was a mikvah. A mikvah was a ceremonial bathhouse. Inside were a number of places where a worshipper could modestly step down into a pool of water, immersing themselves for ceremonial cleansing. The Temple Mount, the first temple to be built, not the one you are looking at, this was the last temple. The first temple was, of course, Solomon's Temple and it was splendid beyond any possible way to describe it. $218 billion worth of gold and silver in that building. I cannot begin to imagine the splendor it would have presented. It stood for almost 400 years until 586 BC when the Babylonians came, destroyed the temple, the city of that day, and took the Jews into the Babylonian captivity. And at this point in history, the Ark of the Covenant went missing. 70 years later, the Jewish remnant returned to the land. They rebuilt a second temple, which they called Zerubbabel's temple. Now it was smaller and grossly inferior to Solomon's. They even used some of the burnt, broken ruins of Solomon's to rebuild that temple. The Bible says that some of the elderly Jews who remember seeing Solomon's temple when they were children, when they saw this rebuilt temple, were so disappointed, the Bible says they sat in the dirt, rent their garments, and wept. Nevertheless, that temple would stand and serve the people for the next 500 years, down to the days of Herod the Great, a name we know, the king when Jesus was born. Now, Herod was, among many other things, a master builder, and he embarked on a very ambitious building project here on the Temple Mount, that would eventually take 82 years to complete, long after Herod himself had died. The first thing he did, however, was more than double the size of the Temple Mount to about 36 acres. And that is what comprises the Temple Mount to this day, 36 acres. Herod surrounded him with four beautiful porticos. The one that ran along this eastern wall was referenced in the New Testament as Solomon's Porch. Then along the southern wall was the royal stoa, an open basilica of absolutely breathtaking beauty. The building that you see in the middle was the house of hewn stone, where the Sanhedrin met to make their judicial ruling. When Satan tempted Jesus to jump from the pinnacle of the temple, that was this corner tower. It was called or known as the pinnacle because the longest drop Anywhere on the Temple Mount was from the top of that tower to the bottom of the Kidron Valley below. 450 feet, one and a half football fields straight down. It would have been quite a jump. The Eastern Gate, located at the Eastern Wall, today the Eastern Gate is a double arch gate and it's completely blocked off with huge, huge stones put there in the 17th century by the Muslims in an attempt to keep the Jewish Messiah King from entering the city of Jerusalem. Well, I think we can safely say good luck with that, right? 
The outermost court was the court of the Gentiles. The warnings posted that if a Gentile attempted to come any closer into the sacred Jewish precinct, they would be put to death. The beautiful gate where Peter and John healed the lame man, and you remember the story, silver and gold have I none, such as I have, you I need, took place at the beautiful gate. The main entry into the court of the women who were allowed there but could not go any further in. It was also known as the court of the treasury because the 13 temple offering boxes were located there. Now the offering boxes were made of wood and they had an opening that was shaped something like an upside down trumpet. And if a wealthy giver wanted to be noticed, they would throw handfuls of shekels hard into the boxes. They would clatter loudly people would turn at the noise, and hopefully being impressed by the big offering that was being given. Because of the shape of the opening, that was known in the New Testament as sounding their trumpets before them. So you probably all heard the phrase, the phrase blowing your own trumpet. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where it got started. And of course, it's not a good thing. The beautiful Nicandor Gate, also known as the Corinthian Gate, gave entry into the court of the priests where the sacrifices took place. The altar of burnt sacrifice, I don't know if you can see it, but it's 48 by 48 by 15 feet high. That's higher than this ceiling. That altar would not have fit in this space. It was absolutely massive. In the same way, the bronze laver with the water of cleansing, 17,000 gallons of water, capacity of a residential swimming pool today. And that water had to be completely exchanged out and replenished every day. That would be quite a water bill, I think. Okay, Herod built up over and around the existing structure of Zerubbabel's temple, a magnificent temple, 180 feet high, and made of the finest white polished marble much of it covered in gold layering. Now the Jews believed that temple would be absolutely indestructible, but in 70 AD, the Romans came, they set fire to the temple, and the heat caused the gold layering to melt and run between the cracks and crevices of the stones. When it cooled, the uh, Roman soldiers dismantled the stones one at a time, scraping out the gold as they went, and that fulfilled Jesus' prophecy that the day would come when not one stone would be left standing upon another. And for the Roman soldiers' love of gold, not one stone left upon another then, nor is there one being put there in the last 2,000 years. Prophecy fulfilled. The fortress of Antonio, a fortified area that Herod expanded and made after his mentor and good friend Mark Antony of Antony and Cleopatra, a famous duo. Across from the fortress was the pool of Bethesda, where the man lay 38 years by waiting for someone to put him in the water for healing. No one could help until one day Jesus came and did what no one else could do. I'm grateful and thankful we are that today Jesus is still doing what no one else can do. The pool of Bethesda. You will note in the side of this hill, there are caves that give it a skull-like feature. That hill is known today as Gordon's Calvary, named after a general, Sir Charles Gordon, a British officer. In 1883, he spent the entire year living in the city. He was a very religious man, and he was somewhat dissatisfied with the location of the traditional place of crucifixion. And that was over here, I don't know if you can see it, uh, the Holy Sepulchre site. A number of large religious groups to denominations hold to that as the place of crucifixion and burial. Protestants generally hold to Gordon's Calvary. Well, which is it? It can be both. Well, we submit to you the critical issue is not so much where he died, but that he died, and that he died for our sins. So Gordon investigated that mount, and on the back side he found a tomb. That's it up there. And if you visit the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem, that's the spot you will be standing on. The two monuments were erected in honor of the two Jewish kings who reigned during that time period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
period of about 400 years. Much of that time, the Syrians ruled in Judea, and they visited horrible, terrible atrocities on the Jews. They literally killed them by the thousands. They desecrated the temple in the worst possible of ways, inside and out. As a result, in a little village north of Jerusalem called Modin, a family, a father and five sons, rebelled. The men of Judea began to gather around that family and formed an army. The family would later adopt, assume the name of Maccabee. And that's because that Maccabee meant the hammer. And when ready, the Maccabean army would attack the Syrians. As far as we know, the world's first Big Mac attack. <laughs> Sorry, <I> couldn't resist. <laughs> So the uh, Maccabean army did indeed attack and hammer the Syrians. After a three-year war, the Jews drove the Syrians completely out of Judea. When they did, the Maccabean family established their own dynasty of religious kingdom. The Jewish people came back to their temple, cleansed it of its many, many desecrations, and rededicated it to God. And that is when Hanukkah began for the Jewish people. The word Hanukkah simply means to dedicate so we read over in John chapter 10, Jesus at the temple for the Feast of Dedication. That was Hanukkah. Jesus was celebrating Hanukkah. I just like that. In the White Tower in the middle of the city was the Tower of Light. Every Friday evening, a priest would climb it. There he is. And when the sun had set, he would signal yet another priest over on the temple tower who blew the big silver trumpet, signaling to the city, Sabbath had begun, the work was to cease for the next 24 hours. Adjacent to the Tower of Light was the House of Records. Priests had to prove they descended from the tribe of Levi. Without proof of lineage, one could not confirm his qualifications for the priesthood and other uh, specific tasks. Even the Messiah would have to prove he came from the tribe of Judah. Now this building, with all of its records, was completely destroyed in 70 AD. So, the Messiah had to come before this event took place. In biblical days, an aqueduct ran across this valley, providing the enormous amount of water required for the Temple Mount services. Remember the labor with the 17,000 gallons of water daily? A magnificent staircase gave access to the lower level streets below, Today, of course, all these structures are completely gone. I'd like to draw your attention to this wall, which runs north and south, and specifically a 197-foot section of the wall that's 62 feet high that we commonly call the Wailing Wall. And that is the most sacred piece of real estate for the Jews today. It's the closest they're allowed to come and pray to the spot where the ancient temple once stood, the Wailing Wall. However, since 1967, the Jewish people do not refer to that as the Wailing Wall, and now call it the Western Wall. A beautiful palace on the edge of the upper city was built by those Jewish Maccabean kings. It was their royal palace with a beautiful, beautiful structure. But it paled when compared to Herod's palace today. He loved to build, and he was very good at it. Herod True was the most gifted architect of the ancient world. He built things then we would have great difficulty duplicating today, even with all of our modern day technology. For example, he laid a cornerstone on the northwest corner of this Temple Mount that is still there to this day. The stone is 11 feet high, 17 feet thick, 47 feet long, and weighs 542 tons. Mm. Until recently, we did not make a crane in this country that could lift or handle that amount of weight. So, how they quarried, moved, and put that stone in place? Well, we have absolutely no idea. Brilliant and building. But a very cruel man, Herod, he is the one who killed and had the babies in Bethlehem put to death, trying to kill the baby of Jesus. Killed ten of his wives, and several of his grown sons put to death. See, they were more popular with the people. He feared they might try to take his throne, so he had them assassinated. That was the kind of man Herod was. Ruled for 36 very long and very bloody years. 
on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He and the disciples made their way to the wealthy section of the upper city to the upper room. They ate the Passover meal, instituted a communion service. Incredible events took place in that room that night. When they had finished, Jesus and the disciples left the city, over to the Mount of Olives, and to the Garden of Gethsemane. Betrayed and arrested, Jesus was brought back up to the upper city, first to the house of Annas, who had been a high priest. A brief but illegal trial took place there, then to the palaces of Caiaphas, who was now the high priest, and another illegal trial. Still in the middle of the night, Jesus is brought to the house of Hewn Stone, where the Sanhedrin had been hastily and illegally assembled. They present their evidence and take a vote against their own Jewish law. Nevertheless, that illegal vote, that they must be put to death, would stand. Only the Romans could do that. So, he's taken to the fortress, where Pontius Pilate happens to be staying Passover. Pilate is here at Passover because hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pilgrims have flooded into this area for Passover. Conditions are right for rioting. Pilate is here to keep the peace. First order of business is this Jesus of Nazareth. He wants a volatile situation off his hands before it erupts into a citywide riot. When he learns that Jesus was originally from the northern region of Galilee, where Nazareth is, he knows also that the river of Galilee is in Jerusalem for Passover week and staying at that beautiful Maccabean palace. The name of that river, Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great. He is the Herod who beheaded John the Baptist. Pilate said this man Jesus is a Galilean, we will all send him to the Tetrarch of Galilee for judgment. Now, Herod, from his perspective, is anxious to see Jesus. He's here at Passover to accommodate him in time. He literally wants Jesus to entertain him by repeating some of the miracles he had heard of him performing in Galilee as if it were some kind of magic trick. Jesus, of course, does not submit to this request. Herod goes forward, <clears throat> he has Jesus beaten, and returns to Pilate. He releases a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. A great irony in the name Barabbas that comes from two Aramaic words, and it literally means the son of the father. The very thing you remember that Jesus was condemned to die for, claiming to be the son of the heavenly. Barabbas. Now his first name, by the way, was Yeshua, Jesus. So put the two together, Jesus Barabbas, the murderer, and the thief, and Jesus, the son of the Father, and the wonderful Savior. Interesting coincidence. Our Lord is taken to the Praetorium at the fortress. There the Roman soldiers torment, torture, finally they scourge him. When he's brought back down to the crown, his body is so mangled that he's hardly recognizable. Nevertheless, they with one voice cry out, Crucify him. He's taken from the fortress. The Gospel of John records that he, bearing his cross, came to the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Golgotha. There, the absolutely perfect, the sinless, the only Son of the true and living God, nailed to a cross crucified, his blood poured out. The Bible calls it precious blood. And indeed it was the very blood of God himself, because that was the only sacrifice that could atone eternally for the sins of mankind. See, Jesus and Jesus alone had the kind of birth and lived the kind of life that qualified him to die, the kind of death required for man's salvation. And that is why he is the only way to heaven. His body is taken off the cross and laid in the tomb, but on the third day he arose from the dead. Forty days later, over on the mount, he sent it up into that magnificent Shekinah glory cloud. And that's one we can all look forward to. The angel saying he's coming again in like fashion. And dear friends, we will see. Our Lord Jesus, Yeshua, is coming again soon. 
Thank you very much for joining me for the presentation. Just want to let you know we've got one more show for you today, a great show. Uh, at the Church of All Nations is for the Prodigal Son. We'll head down this way outside the doors close to the church. Shalom. Shalom.